Okay, hello everyone. We are live. Uh, this is uh, the session on law, crypto assets, and regulation. Joining us today. I'm Sue McLean. I'm a partner at Big McKenzie and I'm co chair of our fintech practice in the UK and also our global tech lead for blockchain. So I was very delighted to host today's session, which is looking at the current crypto asset regulatory landscape around the world. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Agata Ferreira and Cal Evans. And rather than introduce you, why don't I ask our esteemed panelists to introduce themselves. So perhaps we'll start with you, uh, Agata. Thank you very much, uh, Sue. And I'm also delighted to be here, especially because I have participated last year in the conference and uh, and it was, it was wonderful. So I'm very happy to be back at this time as a speaker. So my name is Agata Freira. I am a lawyer by background, scholar and university assistant professor. I am also a UK qualified solicitor, and in the past, I spent over a decade practicing in the city of London finance sector in a leading law firm and in an investment bank. So currently, I am an assistant professor at the Warsaw University of Technology, and I also collaborate with a number of academic institutions and companies on technology and fintech law related topic, which are my main focus. I also have a pleasure to be an expert, um, to join an expert panel um, at the EU Blockchain Observatory and Forum. And uh, I am delighted to be here. So this is a little introduction for me. Thank you so much. today. Absolutely. Um, guys, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, my name is Cal Evans. Uh, I'm an international lawyer. Um, I'm a UK lawyer. I'm also an American lawyer, and I've got some practice rights in uh, in some other places, such as Dubai as well. Um, I focus only in crypto. Um, un unlike my esteemed colleagues, I, co I um, coined a little catchphrase, which is, I'm a crypto lawyer. I'm not a lawyer that works in crypto. Um, I'm managing associate of one of the biggest crypto-only law firms in the world, we're Gresham International. Um, some of you may know me if you've, uh, if you've been following the uh, speaking scene, as I call it. Um, I write, I speak, um, I recently uh, authored the book, The Little Book of Crypto. Um, most recently, I've been working with uh, government-led projects over here in the United States. Um, the darkness in my room is attributing to the fact that it's currently 5.40 a.m. in Los Angeles, which is where I'm based. Um, and uh, I've been doing some regulatory work out here in the United States um, and doing a little bit of work with the European Union as well. So uh, great to meet you, ladies, and good to be here today. Thank you. And, and we've obviously got the right people to talk about this really interesting topic, which obviously um, is at the heart of a lot of people's, uh, you know, hot topics around crypto, which is the fast moving regulatory landscape. Um, and I thought we'd take the time to, uh, you know, take the benefit of our panelists experience and, 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 and all their um, activity in this area. And, and, and perhaps we'd, we'd take a canter around the world. So Perhaps if we dive straight in, Agatha, and, and start with you, obviously up to now, um, you know, the European regulatory environment has really been driven by individual countries taking different approaches to crypto. You know, there's been a sort of marketing element to regulation, I would argue, in some ways, with some countries really wanting to show that they have a, a friendly regulatory environment to try and encourage the, the blockchain and crypto businesses in. But recently, we have started to see more harmonized regulation coming in um, with, you know, 5 AMLD and the proposed markets and cryptos framework. So I just was really keen to understand from your perspective, you know, what's your view on what the regulatory authorities um, have been doing to date around crypto? And, you know, what are the risks and challenges you foresee in terms of regulating crypto whilst trying not to stifle innovation? Uh, yes, that's, that's, that has been indeed my focus, uh, to observe the regulatory developments. And I have observed this over the past years from the first wave of regulatory interest, which con concerned cryptocurrencies. And then we had the second wave, which was the regulatory concern over ICOs. 
And now we are seeing this acceleration of regulatory interest. And I think it's due to several uh, developments. But uh, most of all, uh, recently, especially over the last couple of years now, it will be soon, uh, the announcement of Libra project, which probably was like a, like a trigger for this accelerated regulatory interest. We obviously in Europe have um, new uh, EU administration since uh, 2019, and they have set a certain agenda for themselves. And one of the points of that agenda was to establish regulatory framework until 2024. So we are on course to achieve that with, as you have mentioned, uh, MICA regulation, which is part of digital finance package. So uh, MICA is interesting, uh, indeed, um, momentous regulation uh, in terms of Europe, but also globally, because it is perhaps might be actually a, a benchmark for other countries to either follow or distance themselves from depending on what uh, what the final regulation will look like and obviously as any regu comprehensive regulation like this one it has uh, it has it as its advantages and there are also some issues with it that are currently being discussed so europe is really at this, is this pivotal point to either achieve this uh, fantastic regulatory framework that can be um, technology friendly technology neutral that can draw this capital and uh, regula and innovation towards Europe, or on the opposite, we uh, if we don't get this balance right, we may actually stifle the innovation with the uh, overly burdensome compliance requirements, for example. So I think it's too early to say where we are at the moment, because this, the shape of that regulation will surely change from the project that has been announced in some ways. It is subject to regular legislative uh, process so we are still ahead of some uh, discussions that will surely take place uh, but uh, it is first regulation of this kind on on this scale uh, because as you as you have mentioned there have been some smaller and more agile perhaps jurisdictions with which have come up with their own regulatory frameworks like Liechtenstein in Europe or some states in the US like Wyoming for example but as you have rightly also said they were targeted at uh, in, at uh, attracting innovation towards their particular jurisdictions. And I am not quite sure if this is the same in terms of this MICA regulation. It strikes me at some places as it might actually not be very friendly and overly burdensome. It's a complicated regulation. It's 168 pages of the project. And it is a very, it's the regulation that has a very wide scope. So it covers, it meant, it's meant to cover entire crypto assets universe, including crypto assets that have not been subject to any regulation before and are not connected to financial ecosystem at all. So it's, it's interesting to see this kind of approach from the EU regulator, uh, but it might be that it, with this broad, very uh, all encompassing approach, it may inadvertently stifle some of the innovation and you can see if you read through this project you can see that it has the predominant concern was uh, stable coin uh, stable coins arrangement so this dominates the discussion at the moment in europe at, at least so it may it may also contaminate the discussion in terms of all the other crypto assets that are not uh, this stable global stable coins arrangement yeah, absolutely. Um, I wonder if we can maybe compare that and contrast that with Cal. Obviously, you've got fantastic knowledge of the crypto sort of landscape around the world, given your experience and background. But over in the US, obviously, it's all, all, always been a patchwork approach because that's what the financial services regulatory landscape is like in the US. But I know there has been attempts to try and bring in some more harmonized regulation because there's certain people in the community that are worried that. The US regime is holding us back. And I know I read the other day that, you know, there's another third attempt to try and bring in some kind of token um, law in the US. But what, what's your view? You know, do you think the US need to do more? Is what they're currently, you know, doing enough? Uh, what's your view on the, the US regulatory landscape? Yeah, absolutely so. Um, I mean, it, it, the United States is a very peculiar place when it comes to finance regulation. I think everybody knows this. Um, we have a, 
a patchwork. I, I have to remind people that there are five regulators over here that compete um, for jurisdictional power. Um, and then we do come to this kind of multi-layer regulatory landscape similar to the EU, um, but so contrasting in the sense, whereas member states kind of do what they're told over here in the United States, it's almost like a competition to be as, as kind of wavering as you can be. Um, so really what we've got over here in the United States is um, a, a situation where innovation is always key. The US loves it. And I always actually compare the crypto space to the marijuana space over here in the United States at the moment. There are strong federal laws against the use and the prohibition of drugs, but at state level, it's legalized to a recreational standard. So it's very contrasting. You're technically breaking federal law, but you're not breaking your state law. And the same thing we're seeing with crypto. Um, states like Wyoming, Colorado, Delaware have a great patchwork of crypto legislation. Um, but it's being impugned by federal legislation. And I think, I think most of that problem comes down to the fact that uh, regulators over here are very slow to act, very slow to act at a federal level. And um, more importantly, I think we see that, you know, they are kind of saying, look, we realize that there isn't necessarily the legislation for this, but we do have some legislation in place. So what we've got is a problem where you're taking, you know, modern technology and laws that were written decades ago and trying to smash them together. Um, whereas the EU has a very pragmatic approach of, look, let's step back and look at this. And actually the UK as well. I mean, we've all seen the recent, recent uh, stablecoin, you know, assessment that's going on at the moment. And that's really cool. That's something that the US would actually never do. Um, so we're seeing some very cool things out here. Um, and just to kind of talk to that very, very quickly, um, I worked on the very early days on the Facebook project um, up north in California when it had a much different name and it's gone through three different name changes and four different approaches. But for me, that says everything. One of the biggest companies on the planet that's domiciled in the United States has to take their project to Switzerland to do what it is that they really want to be able to do, for me outlines the massive failing from nothing more than regulators out here in the US. Do, do you think that we'll see, I mean, obviously we've had a new administration, there's gonna be, again, new stakeholders and some of these regulators jockeying for position. I've, I've asked colleagues, you know, do we see uh, a new approach? Because it's not just crypto, right? I mean, FinTech generally, um, it's just been much more difficult to, to do things like open banking in America just doesn't, you know, exist at the moment. So in the same way. So do, do you feel that a new administration and new stakeholders might, um, you know, and COVID actually as the sort of real accelerator of digital change in financial services, do you, do you feel that the mood music might change or it's just still going to be very slow going compared to what we're seeing in other parts of the world? Yeah, that now that is is the biggest question. Um, if you'd have asked me that 12 months ago, my answer would be very different. Um, and, and actually, it, it's to do with the election, but not because you think. Uh, let's put this into perspective. Politics out here is money. It's nothing more. It's nothing less. Um, campaigner donations are a phenomenal, a phenomenal amount of, of legislative sway. Let's say that um, we now have some of the largest financial institutions now admitting that they're buying legacy coins, Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, you know, uh, BlackRock put in a massive ETF on, on Ethereum the other week. And so we're seeing this uh, almost like sway from, well, crypto is going to be a very negative thing to now it's actually going to be a driving force. And so a lot of these guys who put money in are now actually saying, well, look, we, we actually need this regulated and we need something around it. Um, some of the uh, some of the, the folks are commenting as well, the digital dollar, that's the other great touching point. Um, let's make no, no mistake, the United States is currently on paper bankrupt. I don't think that's a global secret. Um, somewhere in the legislative framework, somebody has worked out that there is now an opportunity to create a new dollar, which can be pegged. And so as we see, the only legislation which has been put forward in Congress, in the Senate, is actually on stable coins. And that's because stable coins are what the United States government is planning on producing its own stable coin. So it kind of makes sense that they have to regulate that, right? Um, the landscape out here, do I think it's gonna change under this new administration? Yes, but not how we'd really like it to. 
Um, I think we're going to see a lot of, you know, that kind of really administrative, um, typical, what I call atypical financial services led regulation coming down the pipeline. Um, I don't think it's going to be as innovative as we'd really love. I think it's going to be very um, constraining. I think if you are an entrepreneur looking to use um, mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies, I think it's going to be very constraining. And I think, again, as we saw in 2016, 2017, the US is going to get left behind from this innovation. It really is. Yeah, and, and it'd be interesting, and I'll start with Agatha, but it'd be interesting to hear both your perspectives. Obviously, the UK was very um, kind of ahead in terms of looking at, at blockchain, you know, se six, seven years ago, and then kind of this thing called Brexit kind of got in the way of a lot of the initiatives within government around fintech generally, including blockchain and crypto. But then, you know, they kind of, uh, the regulators caught up a little bit and, you know, when they were very concerned about consumer, you know, um, issues around it, set up the task force, et cetera, et cetera. Now we have, you know, Brexited. Uh, there is a lot of talk that this is an opportunity, obviously, for the UK to diverge from the EU in various areas and and coming up with a sensible but kind of um, uh, more innovative, friendly fintech framework and crypto framework, I think, is part of the mood music we're hearing. Agata, over um, in the EU, do, do, do you have a sense of, 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 you know, discussions in terms of where the UK may end up as opposed to what the, the EU are doing? Or do you think we'll, we'll be broadly consistent for a while in terms of how we approach these topics? And then I'll come to Cal and see what his, his view is from the other side of the pond. Uh, thank you so, for this question. It's actually interesting your perspective and in, and very interesting Carl's perspective because you are, as a crypto lawyer, as you call yourself, you have the concern that the US may be left behind. It's actually identical concern that we have here in the EU, that EU may be left behind. And if you, if you watch uh, this dynamic between the UK and the EU, the UK is uh, one little tiny step behind the EU, which gives you an advantage of actually looking at what EU has done and picking the best bit and take, uh, you know, the, in, introducing your own regulatory framework, which will be that one notch more attractive uh, than perhaps the EU. And obviously as a single jurisdiction, single jurisdiction more or less, the UK, uh, area you also do not have um the do not have the delay which is uh, you know the legal, legislative process in the eu is very slow so you ha you are now more agile and you can act quickly observe what, what we are doing here in the eu and position yourself accordingly but uh, as carl has mentioned uh, that you think that you're afraid that uh, the regulatory framework may, may not be as attractive as you would like and it's actually identical concern again we you know here the the lawyers and the legal community here share this same concern that we fear that the regulator framework may not be as attractive for the innovators as we would like it to be and i think a lot of the regulatory activity is fear driven and that fear stems from a global stablecoin project like Libra, which all of a sudden, because if you if you look at the steps that have been taken, Libra was announced in June 2019, and still in May 2019, various reports came out from from variety of bodies uh, that has said have said that crypto assets are not significant. You know, they're still kind of uh, not that important. It was a little bit of a dismissive approach to that area, and then. A month later, we have stablecoin project uh, Libra, and then all of a sudden, everyone is interesting. And all we can hear since then is all the risks that those kind of projects bring, and very little about the advantages that these projects bring, at least on the official side. <laughs> I think that's right, and I think I think there's still quite a lot of education. I would argue that needs to happen with the policymakers and regulators because a lot of them still just don't have very much um, exposure or understanding of crypto beyond what they read in the you know the headlines which are usually you know a scare stories or at the moment you know all about um you know digital tokens and, and and kind of crazy prices what about you cal what do you think do you think the uk is in a in a unique position to actually as agatha says take 
take kind of the cherry pick, come up with, you know, something sensible, take the bits it likes, but try and not put in, put in a regulation that's too onerous um, to inhibit yeah. innovation. Yeah, I mean, that's the, uh, that's the multi-billion dollar question, isn't it, Sue? That's kind of the gamble that's been, been taken in the UK. Um, look, I, I'm, I'm full disclosure, I'm, I'm an advocate of Brexit. Um, I, I think it's a great thing, um, but it's not happening as quick and as effective as we would have liked to see. Um, just, just as a quick segue, working with the FCA now, um, I don't know if, if you two are, but we're seeing a massive delay. Um, I'm, I'm being very polite in using that expression. It's ridiculous. Um, and everybody's blaming COVID and everybody's blaming Brexit. But at the same time, we're 12 months into COVID and we're more than 12 months into Brexit. And, and none of this is now really a surprise for anybody. Um, so we, we'd all like to think the contingency plans would have started to have kicked in, but apparently not. Um, so what we're actually seeing is we're actually seeing, look, that on paper, yes, we should, the United Kingdom, excuse me, should be a rather agile um, and rather, you know, core focused um, country that's able to do things very quickly. But the reality of the situation is that our process is just as slow as everybody else's. And, you know, we can see this with stablecoin regulation. And it's fantastic that they are, you know, I, I, I worked with the first blockchain task force as well with the Bank of England and the Treasury. Um, in fact, I think it may have been the second, sorry. Um, but they're, you know, they're willing to engage in conversation. They want to know what people think, which is great. But the problem is, implementing that at a realistically sustainable level that can be governed and regulated because at the end of the day the question is who's going to govern it who's going to regulate it the normal response in the uk is the fca fantastic well, right now the fca hasn't even got back on any crypto licenses that people have asked for except for three that are already existing license holders um so if we if we compare and contrast that to the eu and the US, the big advantage now is that you can look at what member states have done and gone, yeah, you know, well, that was pretty cool. We should probably do that. And the US can do the same in Wyoming or, or various other places and go, well, yeah, that was pretty good. We should do that. So the UK, yes, we can we can cherry pick. But the difference is we're not cherry picking within our own regulatory landscape. We're having to cherry pick what other people work. And, and I think we kind of know from our experience of Brexit and everything else, what works over there might not necessarily work over here. So I think it's there's a real conundrum in that if if we are the UK is going to stay competitive, um, then we've got to take a seriously you know serious mm. quick approach about it. Yeah, I, I I think that's right. I think I think there's um, you know there needs to be real ownership of this and, and and making sure that we keep competitive in this area. But the the one thing I think is is interesting to, to think about and ask you is that, I mean, this is true of all law and regulation where, where it relates to, to technology, but I think it's particularly the case with crypto. It is it even possible to try and, I mean, we're never, we'll never be completely up to date, right? But law is always lagging innovation, but the innovation is so, you know, continuous in this space. Um, how do how do the policy and rate you know policy makers and regulators to keep up to date and make sure that if they do introduce a law, it's not out of date you know as soon as they've you know the ink is well the, not that there's ink anymore but you know the ink is dry, <laughs> I'm not you know? I'm not so sure I think I think I think the Queen still signs it I think she still does it by a pen still so you, you, your analogy is right um, I mean I mean that is that's that's the biggest piece of this puzzle isn't it This is where we get down to this law and order versus freedom of economy debate, right? What's better? Is it better to have a, you know, freedom of economy, innovation starting from the ground up and regulators learning from it, or regulators creating laws and then filtering their way down? It, you know, to date, we are so used to, we're gonna create a law and that's gonna regulate everything. And now we're in this wonderful age where we can create something and you know you have to stand in a courtroom and explain to a judge what this is because they have no idea um it's not just that you you can't even bring an expert witness in because two years ago there were weren't really any expert witnesses you know um and so it's you know how do regulators manage this is is really i mean look if you were asking me my personal opinion 
you are absolutely right. You cannot regulate something that moves this quick. We're talking about stable coins in the UK as an example, but it doesn't even cover NFTs. It doesn't even look at the real big picture. Whereas Europe's taken the other approach, let's cover everything. And I may argue on the look of that, actually it's kind of got some pretty big holes in it. So I think, you know, regulators have to accept that we've ch the focus has changed. The game plan has changed. We are now looking innovation down, helping to create the law, not the law regulating innovation. And I always say, whenever I speak about this, I always say, look, we are actually, in terms of this, we are going back in time. We're, we're going back in time in terms of regulation and various other things because people used to, I mean, people used to have ultimate freedom, right? If I used to show up and we've all seen those cheesy movies where somebody rolls into a bar, they ask for a horse, they ask for a bath, they ask for a bed for the night, and they throw a coin across the table. And I just, that's the, just the right amount. It's just, you know, here we go. This should cover this. That's what we're coming back to, that freedom of economy, where actually if I say this Dogecoin, this Dogecoin is worth this much money, it's worth this much money. And if I issue my own currency and I say it's worth this much money, it's worth this much money. And you can only regulate to that to a certain extent. You have to go back to that real native focused legislation of maybe we can't regulate the core, but we can regulate the activity. And so I think that is what we're really going to see, as Americans say, as a band-aid, as a plaster in the, in the interim um, until we work out a really good focal point as to, you know, what do we do better? Do we let it breathe and live and then regulate or do we start regulating heavy and hope we don't suffocate it? Yeah, no, it's, it's a good point. And I, I think we've only really got a couple of minutes left. I gotta, what, what do you think? I mean, I think obviously the risk of just letting it flourish is, you know, consumer protection, consumer protection, people doing stuff without really much education. Um, beyond, you know, the sort of expert crypto folk out there. What what do you think, um, where are we headed? And, and what, what are your predictions over the next few years for regulation in this space? Well, I think that regulators uh, really do have uh, quite a big challenge ahead of them, especially as you said, um, the, the innovation is, is progressing at the revolutionary speed, really, whereas the changes in law are only incremental. So we there is there is this huge gap, and um, we know we we the regulators still have the biggest challenge ahead of them, which I think is this this decentralized issueless projects, which is something that uh, you know there is a great doubt about how to even approach that from a regulatory point of view. So by the time this uh, regulation comes into force, like in like Mika in the EU. The technical, uh, technological landscape would have moved on, uh, and probably in a significant way already. So the best that regulators can do is, I think, educate themselves first of all, but also follow these main principles of techno technology neutrality, principle-based approach, uh, same rules, same regulation uh, type approach, rather than focusing on the technology alone, uh, which would be obviously a mistake because the technological progress is just just amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, absolutely. I think, we, I think we're coming to the end of our time, but I think, I mean, certainly for me, this is why um, crypto is such an interesting area because the law is completely, as we said, playing catch up and you're having to apply existing principles to a completely new phenomenon, whether it's financial regulation or intellectual property law, as we've seen at the moment. You know, there is just... Um, um, a lot going on, and I, I think you're right, Cal, in that, and Agatha, in, in that the, the, the reason that this has really got into the crosshairs of the regulators, and they're not, they're not staying in their kind of wait and see territory, which is what they were sitting in for a number of years, is that there are bigger players getting involved in this space, and there are bigger concerns about how to deal with this phenomena because it's not going away. I think in the past they're like, well, let's wait and see. It's a very small part of the market, but now it's a much bigger part of the market and the big you know incumbents and the regulators themselves are getting involved so you know they they know they want to do something but we'll see i guess who does it right and um and and we'll you know we'll probably end up with uh, a, a continued patchwork of regulation around the world but thank you so much for your contributions it was really interesting to hear both of your perspectives and thanks so much for the chat as well really interesting uh, inputs there and i will hand back um, thank you 
you very much. Thank you very much, Sue. Thank you. Thank you for excellent session, Agatha, Carl, Sue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we conclude the session and we uh, we go back to our uh, next session. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.